Uh, well, good morning and welcome to Foy Parish Church. It's great to see you here. And thank you for those who are joining us on Zoom or on Facebook Live. It's lovely to see the church filling up as well. And um, it's great if you're visiting, particularly here this morning, to, to see you. Uh, do hang around afterwards uh, outside the building. We'd love to chat with you. We hope that as the restrictions open up, we can be easier to uh, socialise with you after the service on weeks going forward. Well, let's pray as we, as we sit. Father, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of meeting together in your name. Thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. Pray as we pray, as we listen to your word, as we sing, uh, that we might learn more of the Lord Jesus and what it means to be in his kingdom and to live for him. Amen. Uh, if you're here with uh, young children, you're particularly welcome. Uh, there is a, uh, an area at the back of the church with books and things if your children get particularly bored with what's going on at the front, which I apologise for. Uh, but don't feel any embarrassment about creeping them back there. And also, there is a loo in the uh, choir registry at the back, up the front of the steps, feel no embarrassment. Um, we, well, the church calendar recognised uh, Ascension uh, this week, and when the Lord Jesus was taken up uh, to heaven. And it's a very encouraging theme as the Lord Jesus prepares a, a place for us in heaven and goes back to send his spirit to us. So let's just hear a few words of scripture to encourage us about ascension. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually, continually in the temple, blessing God. He will access. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who, you have, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Here's a prayer, it's an old language, it's taken from the Book of Common Prayer. Grant, we beseech thee, almighty God, that like as we do believe thy only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to have ascended into the heavens, so may we also in heart and mind thither ascend, and with him continually dwell, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Well, if you happen to have the uh, order of service with you, uh, we're going to say together now the open declaration of paragraph one, together. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Well, with the current uh, COVID restrictions, I'm afraid uh, only I'm allowed to sing in church. But I'm very much looking forward to relinquishing that privilege uh, as we go forward. Uh, but I will be singing two uh, songs this morning. And the first is Jesus is Lord.
It's a wonderful song that speaks of the ascended Lord Jesus uh, sitting at the right hand of the throne, the Lamb upon the throne, the Lamb who takes our sins away. Well, we're going to turn now to repent of our sins, of our need of the Lamb who takes our sin away. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Together let's say, Lord God, we have sinned against you, we have done evil in your sight, we are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love, wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, it's lovely to be here together again. Thank you for everyone that came yesterday to help clear the outside of the church. We really appreciate uh, your hard work. Grateful for the rain to continue to clean the outside uh, pavements. Thank you very much for, for that. It's great to have that um, community spirit within the church. Well, if you're joining us for the first time today, we are in the middle of a journey through uh, Mark's Gospel, um, which has been very exciting. And we're continuing that journey today in Mark chapter 10. There are Bibles at the end of the pews, and it'd be really helpful if you could uh, grab a Bible and turn to Mark chapter 10. Uh, depending on which Bible you've got, um, it's probably on page 1020, 1020, Mark chapter 10. Turn that now to quite a familiar story, the story of the rich young man. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. And as he, that is Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commands, do not murder. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away, sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now and this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. 
Let's pray as we sit. Father, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you that you've left it for us to know all we need for salvation. So teach us now what it means to enter your kingdom and to live as kingdom people. Amen. But do, if you can, keep that open in front of you. It would be really helpful as we look through it together in the next few minutes. Well, as we've been looking through Mark's Gospel, we remember, don't we, that it's a bit like a box set, and it's in two halves, and we're on currently on season two, and Jesus has set his journey, his direction uh, towards the cross. He's very clear now that his mission is to suffer, die, and rise again. But this has not gone down well with his disciples. They are struggling to understand what he is talking about. Peter has even taken Jesus aside and rebuked him. Probably the disciples have a vision of a triumphant Messiah, a triumphant Jesus riding into Jerusalem, a triumphant Messiah who would not suffer. But Jesus is clear he must die because of the desperate state of humanity. And Jesus is also stressing to his disciples the need for his death to shape their discipleship. If he is to die, then they are to die too. Remember what we read in chapter 8. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This cross-shaped life is the way to final glory. Jesus said, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me in the gospel will save it. Jesus is warned, too, about the terrible consequences of refusing to go the way of the cross. Remember his words. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Well, today we meet a rich young man. I think he appears on the scene wearing a crisp suit. He parks his Aston Martin puts on his Ray-Ban sunglasses and heads over to chat with Jesus. Once again, rich people having access to powerful people. <laughs> well, this well-known story is told uh, in two parts. A public event followed by Jesus' private teaching to the disciples. In his public persona, Jesus is perceived by the questioner to be a rabbi or a good teacher, and he's asked a question which a rabbi could be expected to answer. Look down at verse 17. The man says to him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What a great question. Jesus replies, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, and he reads them off. The rich young man replies, teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Well, Jesus answers him with a straightforward route into eternal life. Being good, like God, obeying the commandments, keep the law, and you can have eternal life. The rich young man listens to this and thinks, well, yes, I've ticked those boxes. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Look down at Jesus' response, which is wonderful, isn't it? Jesus looked at him and loved him. You see, Jesus is not primarily coming to the world to condemn it. Hear what it says in John 12. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Or John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Jesus looked at this man and he loved him. Even though Jesus could see beyond the outward appearance of obedience to the reality of the inner man. Jesus could see his heart, and yet his instinct was still to love him. How amazing is that? And that is true for us too, isn't it? Jesus looks at you, warts and all, and still loves you just as you are. Jesus seeing into the rich man's heart, diagnoses his moral sickness in a second. 
he had made an idol of money. And he, in fact, broken one of those commandments that he thought he was keeping, the second commandment. Despite his protestation that he had faithfully obeyed the commandments since he was in short trousers. Hear what it says, the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. Well, the reaction from the man was instant. Jesus was completely spot on with his diagnosis. Look at the sadness of verse 22. At this, the young man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Well, the scene now turns to Jesus reflecting on what's happened with his disciples. His disciples were astounded at what they had seen. They say to themselves, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In the eyes of the disciples, wealth was associated with prosperity and being in God's favour. So how could it suddenly be a barrier to entering the kingdom? Surely if anyone could enter the kingdom, it would be this law-abiding, successful, Young man, what's not to like about him? But Jesus says it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This man's life was his wealth, it was his status, his security, his pleasure, his comfort, and too high a price to lose. He goes away sad. Despite all his worldly riches, joy had evaded him. And the one thing he longed for, certainty of life beyond the grave. Well, for us, nominal Christianity is an easy trap, isn't it? Just giving token time in church for an hour on a Sunday, or a coin in the collection plate. It's easy to sing the lovely hymn, Take my life and let it be, consecrated Lord to thee. That verse 4 is tricky, isn't it? Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. We must remember it's not that money is the root of all evil, rather it is the love of money. Wealthy and generous Christians can be a great blessing to the church. I'm sure our church accountant would agree with that. 1 Timothy 6 says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Command them to be rich in good deed and to be generous and willing to share. Yes, we need wealthy, generous Christians. But living for Jesus will inevitably be costly if we're prepared to lose our lives for him. Well, the disciples are perplexed, aren't they? They say, who then can be saved? Look at verse 27. Jesus says, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Jesus wants us to know that simple obedience to the law, attempting to obey the Ten Commandments, to live a good life, will never get us over the line of the standard required to receive eternal life. Only one man has led and lived the good life. That was the Son of Man, Jesus. You see, it's not just difficult for a man to enter the kingdom, into the kingdom, it's impossible like that camel trying to get through the eye of a needle. For that to happen, a miracle is required. The only way someone can enter the kingdom of God is through a divine miracle. Verse 27, all things, though, are possible with God. And looking back over the previous chapters of Mark's Gospel, his miracles have pointed to that need. Remember the blind man at Bethsaida, whom Jesus healed with a spit of his, on his hands, giving sight to the blind. But not just 
about understanding Jesus. Here Jesus is speaking of something far greater, about entry into the kingdom itself. Jesus is preparing us to understand the necessity of the cross where God makes possible the impossible. Hear what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Well, as we finish, the rich young man should remind us of two truths. Firstly, that entry into the kingdom is impossible in our own strength. Even if you have all that the world can offer you in terms of success and wealth, eternal life will still elude you. You need the miracle of the cross. And secondly, it reminds us of the correct experience of discipleship. What does it mean to live as a Christian? We must deny ourselves and take up the cross. Well, it's unlikely in our culture that you'll be asked to martyr yourself literally in obedience to Christ. Rather, we are to be living sacrifices, aren't we? Remember Romans 12. Therefore, I, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your spiritual act of worship. Well, Jesus finishes off the dialogue with some encouragement to the disciples who think, well, we've given up everything for you, Lord Jesus. What chance do we have? He says to them, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age to come, eternal life. Great encouragement, isn't it? Where should you store up your treasure, store it up in heaven where it cannot perish, spoil or fade. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what this teaches us. We thank you for the love that the Lord Jesus had for that rich young man. Despite his heart um, that was selfish, we thank you, Lord, for the love that you have for each one of us. We thank you that you have made the impossible possible through your death on the cross. That Jesus has opened the way back to heaven. That despite our hearts, we can know eternal life through the Lord Jesus. So pray, Lord, now, as we live for him, that we will be prepared to put our trust in Jesus, our focus on heaven, and to build treasure in heaven for his glory. Amen. Well, Judith, come there. Well, yeah, we have an opportunity to encourage one, one another now in the words of the Creed, an opportunity just to uh, stretch our legs as well. So let's stand and say together the words of the Creed at paragraph 6 together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to death. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. So do please uh, sit down. Well, we're going to turn now to pray to uh, the Lord Jesus, who loves us despite knowing our hearts, and he loves to hear our prayers. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you suffered a cruel death on the cross for our redemption. Yet we have forgotten your pain, 
and stayed in the realm of the evil you defeated. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you were raised from death to bring us new life, yet we have preferred the comfort of the familiar and the empty promises of a sinful world. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you have ascended to your Father and our Father, your God and our God. Plead there at the right hand of God for our forgiveness and entry into the fullness of your presence. Lord, have mercy. Father, we pray for the ongoing uh, strife and conflict in the Middle East and how painful and difficult it is to watch the images on our TV screens and to hear of the suffering. <coughs> we long, Lord, for an end to the conflict between Israel and Palestine. We pray for a lasting peace. We pray for bravery amongst leaders in the Middle East and across the world to seek a lasting settlement. We pray for a world battling against coronavirus and the horrors of what is going on in India. We pray there for a rapid control of the virus, success of all out of the vaccine, sufficient supplies of oxygen and basics in hospitals. Pray for our own nation as we continue to unlock from all the restrictions. Pray about this current concern with the so-called Indian variant taking hold in some parts of our country. We pray for great wisdom from public health and wisdom from ministers and politicians who have to decide on our freedoms. Thank you for the opportunity of the unlocking here in the foyer this week. We thank you for the streets being bustling again with visitors. We pray for all the businesses, the restaurants opening tomorrow and for the busyness of, of that. We pray for, for um, success and um, joyful times on in our in our town. Pray for us as a community as we prepare for the summer for visitors. We better do that safely. We pray Lord for our church here. We thank you for sustaining us through the last year and a half without a vicar. We thank you for the many volunteers who uh, helped, uh, whether whether it's clearing in the garden, whether it's preaching teaching and leading. We thank you, Lord, for the way that we've been drawn together to continue the work here. And we would long that there would be a lasting commitment to Bible teaching and to sharing the hope of the Lord Jesus through this church in the future. Help us to trust you, Lord, when it seems impossible to man. Thank you that things are not impossible to you. We pray for ourselves, Lord, that we would be prepared to be living sacrifices. Help us to know what that means practically as we give up time, our money, our energies for your kingdom. Lord, may we be cheerful givers of time and money. Finally, Lord, we pray for any here today or known to us who suffer in body, mind or spirit that they might know the comfort of the hope of the Lamb on the throne who wipes away every tear. Thank you that we can pray in confidence through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's pray together the prayer that the Lord Jesus himself taught us, the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to sing a final song now, and it is that song that I alluded to in the talk, um, Take My Life and Let It Be. 
and it's to an alternative tune which you have to be kind about because I wrote it. Let's say together the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us this morning. We'd love to chat to you outside, uh, if you're, particularly if you're new with us this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you.